Well, thank you, Brother Mike, and uh, good evening, dear brothers and sisters, Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in our earlier studies in Colossians, we've seen clearly how one of the central themes running through this epistle is the principle of unity, and how the multitude of believers are united in Christ as one single conglomerate entity or body. As verse, chapter 1 of Colossians verse 18 says, the body, the ecclesia, with the Lord Jesus Christ himself as the head. And having established that principle, the Spirit, through Paul then, proceeds to draw certain lessons and conclusions based upon it. One of these being the fact that as the body is complete in Christ, as chapter 2 verse 19 says, as the body is complete in Christ, there's no need for anything else at all in addition to him, such as the observance of the Mosaic law. So in this vein, the apostle gives a warning. Very appropriate to the Colossians, but just as appropriate to our day. Colossians 2, verse 8 to 10, he says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. So here in these verses, the, the rudiments, or as it means the principles of the world, speaks of those elementary principles of the law upon which the then present order of things, or cosmos at that time, was based. And we read of those again in the epistle to the uh, Galatian Ecclesia, where it's speaking uh, of the Israelites being under the Mosaic schoolmaster. It says in Galatians 4 and verses 3 to 5 and then at verse 9, it says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. Now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? So the turning back to the precepts of the law, Paul says was to return into bondage. A bondage from which the Lord Jesus Christ had already provided redemption. And this was the danger which Paul is warning the Colossians against. The Judaizers who were seeking to turn the believers away from the redemption of Christ and then bringing them back into bondage to precepts which could only bring condemnation. But when he's in speaking of the philosophy of the Judaizers to the Colossians, the apostle also speaks of their vain deceit and he speaks about the tradition of men which we saw in our first study indicates how that they were not simply seeking to bring the followers of Christ the believers back under the things that were commanded by Moses but they now also wanted to mingle their own teachings in with the law they thought they could add things to God's word and mingle it in with the law and bring the, the people back into bondage in that way. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ speaks of that in Mark chapter 7. He says in Mark 7, verses 8 and 9, that he was, at this time he was rebuking the Pharisees and scribes for teaching, for doctrines, the commandments of men, for laying aside the command of God. Ye hold the tradition of men as the washing of pots and cups, and many other such like things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the command of, commandment of God that ye may keep your own tradition. So the Pharisees effectively negated the precepts of the law by their traditions, which they had superimposed onto the law. 
and in rejecting the spiritual principles that were revealed to Moses, their righteousness for them stood in the keeping of their own traditions. And hence, you have the apostles' condemnation of it, he says, as just as an empty or vain deceit. You know, and when you think about what was happening there, you know, how much like today's religious scene that is. You know, truly, history has, has absolutely repeated itself in the decline of so-called Christendom to the degenerate state of corruptness, and, and as Revelation 17 verse 5 calls it, of corruptness and spiritual whoredom, which the so-called Christendom is in today. And like the Pharisees of old, the leaders of the modern churches have actually rejected the commandment of God so that they can keep their own traditions to the extent that what's being presented to the people is, is, is void of any spiritual nourishment, being simply the, the humanistic sophistries of, of human wisdom which lead the hearers back into bondage, to the bondage of sin. Now in Second of Peter 2, Verses 19 to 20, we read, this is what the churches are doing. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end for them is worse than the beginning. So it is that the principles of Paul's warning apply just as much, if not more, to our generation than as they did to the Colossians. But sadly, it's actually a warning which very, very few hearken to. Now, the, this, this, this chapter goes on, speaks about the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling, dwelleth in all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now, as we know, the very centre of the Mosaic order of things and the core of, of national worship to Israel was the tabernacle arrangement. And then later, it became a permanent structure, the temple of Solomon's building. And the key idea that is, is found in both of these constructions was to provide a symbolic means by which the almighty creator, Yahweh himself, might dwell in the midst of his people. Now, we see there in Exodus 25 and verse 8, God said to the people, let them make me a sanctuary so that I may dwell among them. Not that Yahweh was personally going to descend from his heavenly throne and physically dwell in the tabernacle, but that the glory of his presence would be there in symbol, dwelling between the cherubim. In Isaiah 37, verse 16, we read, O Yahweh surveyeth Elohim of Israel that dwellest between the cherubims. Thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. So, what we have here is a glory which the people could actually approach to once yearly through the high priest as their representative. But Colossians 2 verse 17 tells us that this was just, this arrangement of things was just a shadow. It says in verse 17, they are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. So it was a type of greater things to come. And as we all know, the law in all its various facets was, was just a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith, as Galatians 3 verse 24 tells us. And so the fullness of all its precepts are displayed perfectly in the Lord Jesus Christ. So it was that that being greater than the shadowy institution of old, We're told that God was in Christ in 2nd of Corinthians 5 verse 19 by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and by the attributes of his glory which was seen in the Lord. So the Lord Jesus Christ, we're told, is 
you can't quite read that. It says there, the Lord Jesus is, in Hebrews 1 verse 3, is the brightness of his glory and is the express, express image of his person. And he is, John chapter 1 verse 14 tells us, he is the word which John says was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory, the glorious of the only begotten of, of the Father, full of grace and truth. So as the apostle wrote to the Colossians in Colossians 1 verse 19, he said, For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. And again in Colossians 2 verse 9, it said, the Father said, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in, in those quotes, what we see is the greatness of the Lord Jesus Christ over the tabernacle, the temple arrangement. There, the glory was to be just a symbol. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, it dwelt bodily. It dwelt in him physically and literally. And not partially, we're told in these verses, but in all its fullness. And as a son, he, he perfectly manifested the attributes of his divine father, being God manifest in the flesh, as we're told in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. His body being the anti-typical temple, John says. And we're told the Father, the Father Spirit dwelt there in Christ, enabling the Lord to perform the miraculous works that he did. So as, as the Son himself declares in John chapter 14, he says, The Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works, Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. But the practical outworking of this teaching is that if all the fullness of divine character dwells bodily in the Lord Jesus Christ, not only is it the case that the law becomes greatly surpassed and therefore must fade away, as we're told in 2 Corinthians 3, verses 7 to 11, if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious, which glory was to be done away, if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. But those who are in Christ by faith and baptism, are also, they also become complete in him. And this is the inspired reasoning of Paul. Paul, Paul says in, in other places, well, he says earlier in this chapter, in, in Colossians, he says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. So in simple terms, if the divine attributes of glory are seen in all their fullness or completeness in Christ, then those who become joined to him in baptism ought also to manifest those attributes and share that completeness. God is in Christ, and we're told we are in him. And as the Lord himself prayed to his Father, in John 17 verse 12, he said, that they all may be one, as their Father art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. Not just one in the Lord, but one with the Father and with his Son. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So the believers then are all one in Christ Jesus. A single, complete, united ecclesia. Ephesians 1 verse 23 tells us. A single, complete, united ecclesia, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Acts 7 verse 48 says, The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, but in the body of his ecclesia, in fullness. Therefore the exhortation to develop the divine qualities of the Spirit and not to be led away by the beguiling influences of man. Now the Apostle Paul in describing how the Lord Jesus has removed the burden of the law from off the believers in, in Colossians 2 verses 13 and 14. He speaks there in those two verses of how he has forgiven you all trespasses 
blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. So this description of a handwriting of ordinances being against someone is very highly suggestive of a very well-known Old Testament passage. And you'll probably realise which passage it is when it's because it speaks literally of a hand or a part of a hand writing ordinances against a particular individual. A writing of condemnation which was not blotted out but was allowed to be fulfilled according to the will and purpose of the one that wrote. So in Daniel chapter 5, at verses 5 to 6, it records for us the idolatrous drunken feast held by Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, when the holy vessels were taken out from the house of Yahweh by Nebuchadnezzar. Those vessels that were taken out by Nebuchadnezzar were then brought out by Belshazzar, and they were used, we're told, to praise the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood and of stone. And in the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king, the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance was changed and his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his loins were loosed as the margin says, the bindings or knots of his loins were loosed and his knees smote one against another. It was a man who was absolutely terrified. But So here then we have a hand writing ordinances against Belshazzar and his kingdom. And the words which were written were interpre interpreted by Daniel. And he says, this was the writing that was written. Many, and I'm not sure if that's exactly how it's pronounced, but many, many tikal ufasa. And he says the interpretation of these things is many, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished. That's what the word many means, to be numbered. So God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal means to be weighed. So thou art weighed in the balances and found wanting. Now, Ufasan, which is the same word as, uh, exactly the same as Perez, means thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So in contrast here to the body spoken of in Colossians, Belshazzar was not complete, not being filled with the fullness of God, but being weighed in the divine balances of justice, he was found wanting. He was told, he was weighed, he was told, you are too light, there's not enough in you, you're too light to be of any real value. The idols he worshipped in defiance of Israel's God, at this time were unable to be of any help to him whatsoever, because Yahweh had decreed, had decreed that his kingdom was going to end that he would be condemned and would die by being overcome by another nation, by the Medes and Persians. And the handwriting of this ordinance, God says, was not to be blotted out. The condemnation would not be removed, but rather it was to be executed fully. And Belshazzar suffered the judgment which rightly fell to him. Now, why does Paul keep taking us back to these things from the Old Testament and these lessons? Well, it's because he's trying to point certain things at us. Now, you notice the physical effect that this handwriting on the wall had upon Belshazzar's body. It says the joints, the bindings or knots of his loins were loosed and his knees smote against one another. So we're being given here a complete contrast to the apostle's depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ's body. Redeemed from a condemnatory handwriting of ordinances. Colossians 2 verse 19 says, in speaking of, it, of the head, it says, the head from which all the body, by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increaseth with the increase of God. 
So whereas the joints and the bindings of Belshazzar's body become loosed, the joints and the bands of Christ's body, we're told, in Colossians 2 verse 2, we're told the joints and bands of Christ's body are tightly knit together. How? Chapter 2 verse 2 says, being knit together in love, being nourished by the head of even the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So Belshazzar provides us with an example of what can happen to a body under the condemnation of a handwriting of ordinances. If the body, if the ecclesia brings in these handwriting of ordinances, Paul gives us a clear example there of what will happen to the body. The exhortation of Paul to the Colossians was that being redeemed from the handwriting of the law, they ought not to allow themselves to be brought back to it in any way. And the pernicious influence of false teachers can only cause disunity in the body. To, to permit and allow wrong doctrine to be taught in the ecclesia will inevitably result in a body like Belshazzar's, unloosed from the bonds of love, disunited, backbiting, smiting itself. That's what Paul is telling us. And this is what the ecclesia at Colossae would have become like if it had been brought back under the handwriting of ordinances by the Judaizers, the handwriting of ordinances which the Lord Jesus had already blotted out. And in contrast to Belshazzar, who was overcome by the power of another kingdom, the apostle describes the victory of Christ over the powers of the Jewish nation, which sought to overcome him. In chapter 2 at verse 15, he said there, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in himself. So Paul continues this theme of separateness from the philosophies of the Judaizers and, and of the various um, feasts and holy days and food requirements of the law because his exhortation continues in chapter 2 at verse 18. He says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshipping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now this verse, particularly the reference to the worshipping of angels, has been the cause over a considerable amount of time, has been the cause of, of, of a great deal of anxiety for many commentators for a, a great variety of reasons have been set forth around this worshipping of angels. But I believe, as do other more learned brothers than me in the brotherhood, but I believe that the verse here is very simple. And the verse should be understood in the context of where it actually occurs, as we should always do with scripture. The Greek word rendered worshipping is actually not the usual word for worship at all. It's only used on three occasions. The word worship actually means, according to Strong's, it's a ceremonial observance. It actually means religion. It's used three other times in Scripture, in Acts 26 verse 5 and James 1 verse 26 and 27. And on each of those occasions, it's rendered religion. So it's not speaking of worshipping an act of supplication, but it's speaking about an entire religious system. Because Paul gives us the example in Acts 26 verse 5, and it says there, after the most straightest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. So the worshipping of angels, I would think, rather relates to the religion of, or it relates to that which was given by the angels, the law itself. The angels passed on the tablets of law to Moses. So it's speaking about that which was given by the angels, the law itself. The inspired writer of the Hebrews speaks of the law in these terms. He says in Hebrews 2, uh, verses 2 to 3, If the word spoken by angels would, was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, 
how shall we escape? If we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them that heard him. So the law itself was given to Moses by angelic hands. We're told that in Acts 7, verse 38 verse, and verse 53. But the word of salvation came by God's only begotten Son. And if those who neglected the angelic law received punishment, what will be the end if we neglect those principles, those commandments that were spoken by the Son of the Creator of the universe? So it was that in seeking to bring the believers in Christ under the Mosaic law, the Judaizers were unwittingly bringing them to something that was greatly inferior to Christ. It was the religion or system of worship from angels, whereas the gospel is from the Son, in whom all the fullness of the Godhead dwells, we're told. So in doing this, the Judaizers, we're told, as we read from uh, in Colossians, were intruding into things which they had not seen. And, and to this day, the Jews have not seen the glory of the law which they appear to delight in. We read there that their minds were blinded. For unto this, until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it sh shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. So this was the true position of these Judaizers. They were spiritually blind, unable to see the fulfillment of the law in the Lord Jesus Christ. But they, they would rather glory in the observance of their own traditions, as, as we're told in these verses, vainly puffed up by their fleshly minds. But, sadly, the so-called religious world in which we sojourn is, is really no better at all. The nations are blinded, we're told. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4, we're told the nations are blinded. If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So they've been blinded by the God of this world by the world and all that it offers, that they, so that they, they cannot see the shining brilliance of the glory of Israel's God and Christ. Then there's, there is then, we're told, a dual blindness or veiling. There's, there's a veiling over both Israel and the nations. They all wander in darkness, unable to see the way of salvation in Christ. But we're told that this lamentable situation is very soon to have an end. And events that are happening in the world right now, the last few days, confirm that for us. It's soon to have an end because at the appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ upon the earth once more, we're told the veil shall be taken away from Israel. In 2 Corinthians 3 verse 16, we're told that, and, and again in Isaiah 25 verse 7, he will destroy in this mountain the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that is spread over all nations. So when the Lord returns, the veil will be removed. And in that day, Israel shall become an exalted people in the earth, the first dominion of the great prince, and the nations will all come to bow before him in recognition of his supremacy and, and the exalted status as the son of the most high God. In that day, the false systems of men's religions will be destroyed and they'll be replaced by a glorious new law which will go forth from the mountain of the house of Yahweh, requiring all nations to appear at the city of the great king to keep the feast of tabernacles and to be taught Yahweh's ways of truth. So our wisdom now, and the, the lesson Paul is trying to bring home to us, our wisdom then is to heed this warning of God's inspired apostle to remain separate from the blindness of the world's philosophies and seek 
as best we are able to become united as a complete body in Christ. Because it is that body, we're told in Revelations 1, verses 13 to 16, will be subject to glorification. When all the pretense of false worship will fail <coughs> and be exposed for all its fleshly weakness. And it's the individual members of that body which will come to be partakers of divine nature and so be filled physically with the glory of God and so truly become even as our Lord Jesus Christ. Colossians 2 verse 10, it says, Ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now, throughout our studies, we've seen how the inspired Apostle Paul warns the Colossians of the Judaizers who sought to add elements of the Mosaic law combined with their own traditions to the requirements of the gospel. And a key feature of their philosophy was the insistence on circumcision for salvation. Now, they taught, and we read in Acts 15 verse 1, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. And it, was, it is this requirement which, which is especially dealt with in this epistle to the Colossians where, where Paul expounds the true significance of circumcision and how it points, the spiritual points it taught can be manifested by us, by the Lord's disciples. He, he speaks of the Lord Jesus Christ in, in Colossians 2 verse 11, uh, 10 to 11, he says that he is the head of all principality and power in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So in some sense then, although the Gentile believers at Colossae were physically uncircumcised, we're told that that's a fact in Colossians 2 verse 13, the spirit of circumcision took place in their union with Christ, for in him they are deemed to be circumcised, but without hands. In actual fact, the ordinance of circumcision didn't originate. It wasn't included in the, in the law, irrespective of the claims these Judaizers, Judaizers were, had made. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ made that clear in his dialogue with the Jews. In John 7, verse 22, he says, Moses therefore gave unto you circumcision, not because it is of Moses or of the law, but because it was of the fathers. And ye on the Sabbath day circumcise a man. Now, the reason why Moses enjoined circumcision upon Israel I mean, was not because it was formed, because it, it formed part of the other ordinances which came to him from the Father, but because it was of the Father's. It was handed down. It was a practice which became incorporated into the law, but in actual fact had its origin with Abraham. Acts 7 verse 8 says, He gave him the covenant of circumcision, so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. So it was given to Abraham and was associated with the giving of the new covenant to Abraham. But it was a token of faith. That's what it was all about, a token of faith in the new covenant. Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 9, describes for us, as we probably all well know, the giving of certain promises to Abraham, including the establishment of a covenant between him and his seed, particularly the preeminent seed, even the Lord Jesus Christ. And it speaks, ultimately, of the future, when Abraham's seed shall be given with him, we're told, his seed will be given with him, in Genesis 17, verse 8, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And as a token of that covenant, the practice of circumcision was commanded. In Genesis 17, verses 10 to 4, we read, This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee, Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man child in your generations. He that is born in the house 
or bought with money of a stranger, which is not of thy seed. He that is born in thy house, and he that is bought with money, must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised man-child, whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now when we read that, in these words we find a number of very important details which are interesting but are important. Firstly, the circumcision was to be enjoined upon certain Gentiles as well as the Jews. Those who had been bought with money of any strength, anyone who was a slave or a servant, if they were in the household, if they by that means become part of Abraham's household. So we have in type the manner in which the Gentiles could become joined to the household of faith, being bought by the shed blood of Christ. As the Apostle wrote immediately after this discourse on the subject, in 1 Corinthians 7, he said, He that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be not ye the servants of men. As we saw earlier, in Christ, all members of the household become, in a sense, circumcised, but without hands. Because we're told in Romans 2, verse 29, He is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And another point which is not immediately apparent in the Genesis record is that Circumcision was given as a token of Abraham's faith in the, covenant, in the covenant that was made with him. In Romans 4, we read that, that faith, was, faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness, not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that righteousness might be imputed unto them also. So then it was a sign then which spoke of the faith of Abraham in Yahweh's covenant with him, made when he was yet uncircumcised. And this was the significance of circumcision under the law. It, it, it should have reminded Abraham's natural seed of the principles of the new covenant and the promises which Abraham had absolute faith in. It was given as a token of his faith and in essence it taught the Jew that righteousness was not by the observance of law but by sharing the faith which Abraham had, of which it was a sign. And in this way it would have led them to the Lord Jesus Christ to whom the promises relate and through whom they are all to be accomplished. So then, circumcision then was a physical sign which distinguished Israel from the nations around them. It was only the, the Jews, the nation of Israel, that would have this done. So it, it distinguished them completely. And they were to be a people chosen by God, and they were to stand out in this one way. So literally speaking, it was the cutting of the, off of the flesh. And so carries the spiritual signification of cutting off of the fleshly lust of the heart. And as we said earlier, circumcision is that of the heart, as Romans 2 verse 29 said. It spoke of the faith which ought to have been manifested in Abraham's seed, and it speaks of righteousness and purity, wherein un whereas uncircumcision in script Scripture always speaks of the way of the flesh, or defilement, and it's a term of reference to some of the ungodly Gentile nations around Israel at the time, most notably the Philistines. So Israel, although literally circumcised, were exhorted by Moses to circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked in Deuteronomy 10. Yet although the people went through various phases at times of national faithfulness, the cutting off of the flesh for them was very, very painful and it was not at all pleasing to the natural man. So their hearts remained as they were. They failed to heed the word of the living God, for the barrier of the flesh obstructed their spiritual hearing. As Jeremiah lamented in Jeremiah chapter 6, 
And he said, To whom, behold, their, their errors uncircumcised, and they cannot hearken. Behold, the word of Yahweh is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. So he, as, as, as Moses exhorted the people, in chapter 4, verse 4, he says, Circumcise yourselves to Yahweh, and take away the foreskins of your heart, ye men of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire, and burn that none can quench it because of the evil of your doings. Now, they failed to hearken when they were given this message. And the promised destruction duly came upon them. But the matter doesn't end there for Israel. However, because for the new covenant of which the sign of circumcision is testified is yet to be accomplished through the Lord Jesus Christ as the Deliverer, who shall come out of Zion and turn away ungodliness out of Jacob. So, And Moses spoke of this time, the time of Israel's future regathering and, and the subsequent glorification in the land. In Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, he said, Yahweh thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love Yahweh thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. Now, when you read that verse, it leaves us in no doubt whatsoever what is to be circumcised. It is to remove the fleshly covering of our hearts, which proves over time to be a barrier to things divine. It is to become spiritually renewed, that we might love Yahweh, Israel's God, with all our hearts and with all our soul, that we might become heirs together of everlasting life, according to the promise of the Abrahamic covenant. And in that day, all who dwell in Jerusalem and all who pass through there on their annual pilgrimage to give homage to the King of Kings shall be spiritually circumcised. Because this is what Yahweh it says in Isaiah 52 verse 1, he says, Put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on thy beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For henceforth there shall no more come unto thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. So we then, brothers and sisters, we are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, as Colossians 2 verse 11 tells us. If we have faith in Abraham's greater seed. As the Apostle Paul taught the Philippians in Philippians 3 verse 3, we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So literal circumcision was just the literal removal of a small part of the body. But circumcision in Christ is far greater because it is the putting off of the bodies of of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Colossians 2 verse 11 In whom also ye are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So we brothers and sisters should rejoice in the faith of Abraham's God that we also can take the lessons that were taught to the Colossians into our life Lives and that we also, in unity and love together, can find life in Him.